Let's get you going. We need to do some reading. And uh, I'm going to make this as painless as possible. Uh, I've taught systematic theology for many years. I've taught it for a number of years at Dallas Seminary. And then I taught in Michigan. And of course, up at Faith in Tacoma. And now here. Actually, I taught at a college many years. Well, Charlie, were you going to college? Oh, yeah. I taught there for seven years. Engineering. A lot of engineers. I almost went there. Yeah. I went there. Yeah. It was a good school. It was a good school. And uh, so, uh, so I've taught at all different levels. Um, so uh, this is something unlike Greek, which many of you are probably a little bit uh, anxious about. Uh, theology is nothing to be scared about. Uh, actually, Greek isn't either. It's according to how you're, you're taught, I suppose. But uh, theology will be auxiliary. Uh, now, the first area in prolegomena may not be as much, uh, although there's some issues that we talk about that are pretty significant, especially for apologetic concerns. By the way, is this tape on? Yeah. Have you pushed it already? So yep. tape? Okay, that's fine. Just leave it on. Am I, am I in the view? You're right there. Okay, I'm right here. I can see this. All right. So uh, we will uh, be going through a number of areas that are very important to look at. I've got to give you an overview first, and then we'll move to more specifics. And uh, the area, of course, that occupies most of the time will be the doctrine of Scripture. So this is the first course in theology. So you have theology one, uh, two, actually there's 20 hours of theology. And so you have, uh, and we'll talk about those different areas as I go through the, uh, the subject tonight. I'm sort of uh, actually killing a little time thinking that's going to come up any second now, and I'll be... Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah, sure. Uh, will we need to take notes, or do we yes. put our notes in here? You can put your notes in there, but I'll take some notes, too. Because I'm not going to just simply follow this book. I'm going to be giving you some stuff, too. Uh, I'm actually working right now on a, on a systematic theology of my own, about a 1,600-page one. And so you'll be getting some things that I'm talking about in my systematic, which are a little different than what Dr. Cook has here. But this is really quite a good book, and I think you'll enjoy it. He never got this thing in a print. He was one of the finest teachers I've ever had. I had him for several classes in theology years ago, back in the early 70s. Very precise person. You know, just knew how to put language together and say what he needed to say and, and get it over, and a good, clear thinker. Uh, he was an excellent professor. And I had a chance to see him the other day. It was really exciting in that lectureship. Uh, oh, that was... Yeah. Young Dr. Dr. Cook's dad. Young Dr. Cook's dad, old Dr. Dr. Cook, when he did this. Obviously. And uh, he's the kind of guy, unfortunately, I, I've known several people like this, that uh, they are they, they really are very good in what they do, and they write well, too, but they never can seem to get to the point that they're ready to publish anything. In other words, they're always improving it. And if you, you'll never publish anything if that's what you do. Because there's, I, I've written now well, almost, well, not quite in print, but almost 30 books. And I would have never gotten one book out <laughs> if I did that procedure, because you can always find improvements. My view is I'll put it out, and uh, people can get the benefit from it, and later on maybe I'll, I'll uh, put a second edition out or something or another if I don't. You just simply are never going to say everything you want to say or could say or should have said. Or, I mean, we don't live in perfection. So you, you make those decisions. But I know another guy, a very brilliant guy, who did the same thing. And, but Dr. Cook is really outstanding as a prof. And he, he writes well. And I think you'll enjoy this book. It's be good to have it. Very few people, because he hasn't published this, have the privilege of having this in the library. And it will prove to be a benefit to you. Let me now uh, get this up going. The, uh, I'm trying to find the systematic theology thing I did here real quick. chance to see my computer in action here. Uh, <coughs> I can actually try to see if I can get it through the actual program. I'll do that. See if it come up. I may actually find it for me. I don't know. There it is. Yeah. question. You said
says in outline form, what does that outline form mean in comparison to any other form? I mean, I have well, a theology. If, yeah, yeah, if you look at his theology, it's sort of like, you know, like a woman in one little baby. You know, he's got to sort of organize that way. Probably originally, uh, the systematic uh, was less full than it is now. I suspect it has a history to it. But it was more like an outline. Like here, I have an outline in my systematic theology. I've got an outline right now in my systematic, which is about 160 pages long. That's an outline. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out, now, if you have a 160-page outline, just ten times that amount, I had my entire theology ready. So I may have to. I don't know. I keep. But we started out as a 1,400 page systematic theology. Now it's 1,600. I can't seem to uh, decide uh, those things I want to put in there, but I will do that. <laughs> but uh, we're going to look then at the uh, theology now. First of all, I'm going to talk about the course a little bit, and uh, then then we'll get into the theology. Uh, this is, again, uh, the first course in theology. Uh, we will cover what is called prolegomena, which is a technical term. I mean, you may say, why don't you use easy language? Well, all disciplines have a language, whether it be medicine or law or engineering. Or every discipline has their jargon and language, and so does theology. We use terms that are readily, are readily understandable to those people in the field. If you know Greek and you know Hebrew, you can figure out pretty well everything's going on in terminology and theology. Uh, much of our, as you'll see when we talk about some of these terms, are built on Greek. But uh, we'll call, talk about prolegomena. You don't worry about this right now. But prolegomena, which is the first thing. It's, it's from the Greek word logos, actually in a, a prepositional form, legomenon, which is a, pre, I mean, in a participial form. Speaking first, in other words, the first things you say or talk about is the introductory issues. And then the next area is what is known as bibliology, which is biblos, book, or used for Bible. So logos essentially means study of. Now logos means more than that. It means a word, it means a thing sometimes, it means a statement, but it also can mean the idea of study. Study of scripture. The, uh, the Bible. And uh, so all our subject matters we're going to go into in a few minutes, I'll show you that. So that's the area we're going to be talking about. This is four quarter hours. <coughs> Prolegomena will take us for essentially two and a half class periods. So tonight, next week, and half of the next, and we're done with Prolegomena. That's one hour's credit. Now you may wonder why I divided it that way the curriculum so we have one and three when everything else is four. And mainly because uh, there are many schools when they deal with theology really do not cover polygamy very well. And so you'll start off with their basic introduction to scripture and maybe God or something. I've divided it differently. And uh, I think it's important to talk about some of the introductory questions. And I'm, you were doing one hour's credit for it. But oftentimes if you don't cover these kinds of questions, you never really have the time anywhere to develop it in the same way as you would at the beginning. So it's important to have an intro. So we've, do, we've done it that way in the curriculum to get one hour's credit. Also, if a person, for example, comes into the school as a transfer and has had their entire sequence of theology, but I want them to have prolegomena, then I, I don't have to take all prolegomena and bibliology when they already had the theology. So I just have to take them an hour and they're done. So they're doing two and a half weeks and they quit. So it's a way to sort of work out the, the uh, curriculum. Um, obviously the study of prolegomena and bibliology are, are foundational for the rest of the study of theology. If you want to uh, study the doctrine of God, you need to know where you find the information. And it's found in the scripture, primarily. And in prolegomena, we also talk about issues of faith and reason, matters relating to general revelation and such that also provide information. So. All these subsequent doctrines of theology build upon an understanding of the doctrine of Scripture and first things. So these are the reasons for the study that we have now, the first course in theology. Uh, to say about what kind of requirements you're going to have in this class, uh, you do not, I'm not going to ask you to do a paper for this class. I am going to give you a couple of things that will cause you to be very, 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 very uh, thought provoking that I'll ask you to interact with. And they're not exactly exams, they are 
there are papers to cause you to have to think through things logically and theologically. You know, you'll see them when the time comes. Nothing you can prepare for uh, will be something that will just test your ability to think through the theology. And uh, I have students in the past who told me they really enjoyed it. So you'll see it's, it's based on a model that I use when I taught law also. I used to, uh, used to teach law in law school. So. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law approach to critical thinking. The, uh, there will be a, a couple of exams during the quarter probably. I think I'll divide it out rather than give them to you all at one time. We'll do one on prolegomena, one on bibliology, and then we'll have two exams. And probably no direct final, as you might think, but probably a couple of exams and then this, these couple of these critical response papers. And that will be the course. So, you, so here, take a break, enjoy, uh, because you don't have to at the end be uh, asking for an incomplete because I haven't got my paper yet. <clears throat> so I know that I have you to do papers quite a bit. And you will see them again. But uh, this, this quarter, this will not do that. I think you'll have them to do in other classes. Uh, the exams, just to give you perspective, probably will count <clears throat> like about 30% apiece and probably the other papers, maybe, maybe 20 or maybe I'll about 70 and 15, 15 or something. But the bulk will be the exams. And the others will be, um, uh, we'll divide it with either 30% uh, or 40% of the grade, I'm not sure yet. Now, the textbooks for the class, you already know, uh, you have the uh, cookbook here, of the Christian faith. Uh, they used to call this the cookbook back in the seminary days. And there's a reason why. It's a book written by Dr. Cook. It's the cookbook. Also, a little thing that I put together, I actually came out with this in 1992, so that's over 10 years old now, I have a 10-year anniversary of this. Uh, this was the, uh, well, it's down the way, this, this is the first book I wrote, maybe, maybe the fifth or sixth. Uh, but this actually now is used throughout the United States, and basically pretty well every seminary and Christian college in America uses it. Uh, lots of doctoral students have told me they use this to study for their, their doctoral orals. So it lays out everything very concisely and organized in a way you can memorize it, keep it down. And so uh, we'll be looking through this and using this throughout the class, uh, including our discussions here about the issues of polygomina. If you look in the beginning pages, you'll see that I have five charts that relate to prolegomena, distinctive traits of theological systems, contemporary feminist theological models, Guide to the Interpretation of Biblical Text, Comparison of Covenant Theology and Dispensationalism, and a Representative Dispensational Scheme. We'll be <coughs> presenting some of those kinds of questions here, and we'll look at those for the class, so you can look through this. Um, and just, you know, just read. Now, you haven't got as much to read as you might think. If you look at this book here, I, I haven't uh, looked at it for a while, but the only book, here we go. You only have to read 95 pages. Now, if you know anything about when I normally teach, uh, that's pretty light reading. Uh, it's not unusual to have, for reading for a course, to have, you know, five, 800 pages at least for a course of reading. So I've been trying to think, what can I do to burden them down some more? So uh, I just can't think of anything, Greg. So if you come up with something, let me know. Yes, sir. OK. I'll put a lot of effort in there. <laughs> So, uh, so here, well, you just are required to read this area of theology. What's that pages? Uh, pages 1 to 95, I think it is. So, or 92, or whatever it was. What did I say? So it's, but what I do expect you to read, let me, let me just make this real plain. What I do expect you to do, as you work through the book, I want you to have a Bible in your hand, and I want you to read every, catch me now, listen to me. I want you to read every single passage mentioned in the text. Not just look at the text and take his word for it. I want you to read the passage and see how it relates to the, the text. Now that will slow down your reading a little bit, but then again, I'm not asking you to read five to 800 pages. So I really do expect you to read the text. Theology, hopefully, is built, not all times, but theology hopefully is built upon the biblical text. And so, if you're going to become knowledgeable and adept at theology, hopefully what you will do is give yourself to study scripture. 
I, if you haven't caught it by now at Oregon Theological Seminary, one of the reasons for its very existence is that I want people of God who are going to be involved in, in whatever form of ministry to be knowledgeable of the Word of God. Uh, nothing else is more important. Uh, people want to say, I wish I knew what God wants, or I wish I knew God's will, or I you know this or that. Well, let me tell you, it's one place, and that's it. It's not in your night visions and dreams. It's not in your feelings during the day. It's not in even what somebody tells you on the street. It's, it's found in the Word. He's, God has spoken what He wants to say. And if you want to know what it is, find it here. If you find, now, if you come up with another way to get God's will, then we need to write it down here in the back so we can all keep records. Because we need that information. That this is the book, and this is what I want you to master. You're going to get a master's degree in right. Master of Theological Studies or Master of Divinity, most likely. Now, is there anybody doing Master of Theological Studies? I'm not sure. We'll need to talk about that. Because, see, our Master of Theological Studies is a great program because it allows you, with two years of an AA or, or more, to go ahead and do a BTH. And the, and the second year, the last, you don't need to do two years of BTH. The second year of the BTH is the first year of the Master's. Automatically, you've got a year of Master's now. So it's a really shortcut way. And this is all legitimate by accreditation standards because you know I'm going to be moving as fast as my little feet will carry me toward accreditation. So um, we, we will, you know, eventually though hopefully you'll have a master's degree. And so I really do want you to be a, what did I say, a master of scripture. And not just a neophyte and amateur. I want you to be a master of scripture. So we're going to be looking at the text a lot. Now, we don't look at the uh, some classes you should study. And, and by the very nature of the classes, you don't, you know, you don't interact with the text as much as some other classes. Some classes are more philosophically oriented. And that's okay. It's not bad to have that. If I taught you a basic class in logic, we wouldn't be going to scripture much. We'd be dealing with logical thinking patterns and critical thinking. You know. But uh, classes in Bible and theology all be interacting with scripture. So I expect you to do that. Um, this quarter, uh, again, we'll go 10 weeks. 10 weeks will pass rapidly. Uh, my life is going rapidly. <laughs> Every time I turn around, I'm a year older, and I keep thinking, you know, this is weird. Is that not <laughs> it is. And every time I get that, you know, it seemed like I was 30 yesterday. I don't know. So it just keeps moving, but that's okay because. Uh, it doesn't matter how long you're in this life, because this is but a drop in the, in the seas of the earth, and reference to, to our life that's to come. So anyway, we, uh, we need to deal with it effectively. Now let me see if there are any questions at this point from what I've mentioned. The remainder of this book is to be ignored for the time being. For right now. As we go through theology, eventually, you will go through this entire book. Other classes. Other classes. Right. Because uh, there's the other classes we'll have, I'll show you here in a moment on the when we go through this material. This okay? book in its entirety. That book, no, just as it relates to this class. Okay. Again, this book will be used throughout. I mean, I did the book. It's and it's not as though it's. I know people have published their own little book with their own public private, you know, the local printer, and use it. And that's okay. But this is a book used by just about everybody, and so I feel like I could use my own book since <laughs> people. <laughs> And well, what we do is we'll be using only the sections that relate to the course. So by the end of the seminary, you will actually use this. But matter of fact, in eschatology, you will be using also another book that Randall Price and I have done called Charts of Biblical Prophecy. Is it, it be, finished? Uh, it's 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 well, it's been finished. But well, I won't go into that on, on the, on the table. Right. It's been done for some time. Right. It's another issue. All right, now. Uh, we're going to uh, work through both of these sources. Now, let me ask, have you read any of this at all? Am I catching everybody just fresh? No. Just got it well, last night. Just got it last night, so you don't. So that's okay. You'll need to go back and read. Okay, don't say, well, we've got that covered. I don't have, there's not but a few pages. Read the whole thing. All right, that's your responsibility. So... Uh, but we're going to be looking at what he has to say in here, and we'll also be looking at some stuff I'm going to be putting up here. Things I put up here you need to write down. And obviously you've got it written down here, you can put notes here. So just, just put it all together, all right? 
Uh, I had figured out exactly, I think it was about 20 hours of it. So they like five glasses uh, Yeah, let's see, I'd have to work it out, but you'll see it in the categories here. I can probably put it together. That's one, two, three, uh, four, five. It looks to me it's either five or six. Can I ask one question, maybe off subject, but in your opinion, what's the greatest need? Because you, you started down the path talking about masters of theology. What is the greatest need in this world, in your opinion, today, as pertains to students of theology? Yeah. Yeah, I, was uh, say I, I don't mean water. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean water, Jesus. air, Jesus, <laughs> but I meant what what should we do with this class? I mean what you should, well, there's several things. One is, you should use it as a basis of further study that we're going to use. Secondly, you should use the class in your daily life because you should learn to think in a certain way. See, in Pro and I'm going to talk to you about thinking a certain way. That should then change how you think on a daily basis about the world. You need to learn to develop a worldview, see things differently than other people walking down the street. Because you've had this class, you should be more astute to theological ideas, uh, more, more, uh, or keen about understanding scripture, there should be things that the class changes in the way you are as a person and the way you think as a person. But I meant, uh, I didn't say that right, because what I meant was, if we follow through and become masters of theology, what in your view is the critical need of the world in the world today? Pastors, teachers, okay, uh, archaeologists? <laughs> there are all sorts of needs. I mean, and the thing, and that's the wonderful thing about it. Uh, there are so many needs. God has places for everybody. My view has always been God has a prepared place for a prepared person. Hello? Anybody for Beethoven? Mine does the same thing, but it's not mine. Would you get this and, and, and tell it and tell on the class and get a number and I'll call them back? Just push the little talk button. Talk, 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 talk. Look, it's a little green button. Green one. Okay. Yeah. All right, now, um, so that for a prepared person, there's a prepared place. Now, God knows. I know. And that's the whole thing. My, some people are always desirous to know about, you know, uh, what is the will of God for me? You know, the will of God for you is to live a life that pleases God. <laughs> and and where you end up and what job you do is really somewhat uh, irrelevant. I mean, that, that, will, that will come along. My view is that there are four ways to know God's will. Uh, one is to, uh, don't worry about it, just keep it in there. He may call back and if he does, push talk. It says unlock, isn't that right? It's okay because talk, if somebody calls you, it, you can talk on it. You just can't call out. Right. So four ways to God's will. Yeah, four ways. So first of all, I think in knowing the will of God, you have to, uh, you have to decide whether something is or is not in conformity with the revealed will of God. I don't have to pray, God, is it your will that I rob a bank? I know it isn't. It, it would not conform. God, do you think I should dump my wife and find somebody else? I mean, what's your will? I'm desperately seeking your will, you know. Uh, you don't have to pray about those matters, okay? If, you, if it's conformity to the will of God, whatever presents you, then if you get past the first order, you move to the second. The second is, has God prepared you for the position, or, or secondly, is, is, is there a position coming your way, and if there's no options, there's no doors opening, I wouldn't worry about things. <laughs> Just wait for the door. Thirdly, are you prepared? In other words, have you gotten to the place that you can actually accomplish the thing that's been asked of you? You know, if, for example, Lord, you know, should I, should I go off and... Uh, and be, be an evangelist when, uh, for example, I, I've never won anyone to Christ. And I'm going to be Billy Graham. I'm going to start at the, I, I want to start big, you know, with 50,000 people or more, not one, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, where are you in reference to how God has prepared you, how you're functioning, how your training is, and so forth. If God, is, if God wants you to be a Greek scholar, for example, or he wants you to work on ancient manuscripts, and I suspect you have to learn the language. And I know that some people believe that anything God wants you to do, He just sort of poofs and all of a sudden you just become fluent. I've had people say that, 
Well, so and so, he couldn't read the Bible. He couldn't pick up and read the newspaper. He couldn't read a sign on the side. I heard these stories when I grew up. Couldn't read a sign on the, uh, on the side of the street that he could pick up the Bible and read it fluently. And I'm saying, I have a serious question about that. I doubt if that's true. If that is true, then we really don't need with the Bible translators and some of these other people. We just need to go to these tribes and pray that God gives them the gift of tongues. Gives them the languages they need, and they don't need to be kept in learn language. It's give them the Bible and say, read this. You don't know a language yet? Just learn this one. You don't have to learn it. Just pick it up and read it. See, you know, I, I don't believe this. Uh, we don't find God operating extra historically. God tends to operate within a historical framework. He uses what's here. I mean, he created what's here, and he uses what's here. When he decided to drown the Egyptians, he didn't use anything but water. He could, I, I suppose he could find some other thing, but he used what was handy. It was called water. And, you know, when, when he decides to uh, to work in reference to the plagues in Egypt, he, he keeps using things that relate to what's going on. Matter of fact, there's a reason why pestilence came on, on the hills of cattle dying. And these things are cause and effect relationships. And I have no problem with that. The, the issue is not so much that something happened. It's that how it, when it happened and how it happened in response to God's, uh, God's uh, decision. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in, in, in our lives, too, God uses our capabilities. He uses what he created in us. I started preaching when I was 14. I suspect somewhere back there I had the gift of gab. Uh, I've always taught. Ever since I was this high, I've been blabbing. And it just sort of came with me, just built in. And I think it was there because God had a plan for me. And I don't think it's, you don't catch him by surprise. He's always moving you toward where he wants you to be. And, for example, if you have absolutely no knack with languages, I doubt if you're meant to be an international linguist. So that's the kind of thing. What you do is you train yourself the very best you can. And then you're ready when God opens up something. And all of a sudden it makes sense. I really believe that. He will open a door that you will be prepared to enter when you get there, because he's working behind the scenes preparing. And so I don't worry about that. I never have. You know, I, I, you just you just get the best training you can and God will open the door. Now, there are lots of needs. There's a need, for example, for, uh, uh, I haven't got the fourth one here. Okay, thanks. But uh, I believe there are needs, for example, for uh, New Testament textual critics, people who are working manuscripts. Do you realize there must be manuscripts lying in universities all over the world that have never been looked at, and we don't even know what we have. We may have something more significant than anything we've ever seen. Nobody's opened them up because there's nobody to work on. Really? Oh, yeah. There's an absolute dearth of people who are scholars and working in this stuff. Uh, so ever so often, you'll come. Somebody will publish something. You'll find some brand new thing that nobody's ever seen before, and it's been there all the time. Just nobody was working on the project because. How many people are fluent enough in Greek or in Latin or Hebrew or a very Semitic language just to do any of this stuff? And it's, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, have, have they been working on that for most since 48? And uh, basically a few scholars. Only, you know, a few in comparison. So, um, a lot of needs in biblical studies, theological studies. Um, W.F. Albright, I'm just encouraging, W.F. Albright was a biblical archaeologist. But as I understand it, he uh, actually had only begun to work on his real Semitic languages when he was about 55 years old. That's when he started really working to learn Hebrew and all the Semitic languages of the ancient Near East. And he became one of the finest linguists the world's, you know, world's had. He's, he's, he's a brilliant scholar. He called himself an Orientalist. When they asked him for a specific designation of what his you know, like if you're a epidemiologist or if you're a, you know, you're a uh, astrophysicist or so, well, what is your area? He said, well, I'm a, I'm a uh, Orientalist. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. He said, because I know all the cultures and all the languages and all the history. And all. He says, I know it all. But he, you know, he was the person who gave himself a considerable study and really quite a pretty evangelical. Most people, in, in some studies consider too conservative. Not for me, but for them. And the fourth thing, uh, if, if in fact it's not 
contrary to Revelation, if in fact there is an open door, if in fact you're properly prepared. The last thing I think you always do in, in trying to decide these things, do you, do you have peace with it? As long as you don't have peace, you don't need it. It's best not to, uh, to jump into something that you can't feel good about, because I, I think that uh, something's just not right. I think it's, it's, it's unwise probably to move against something that you feel absolutely comfortable. But anyway, that's just my own perspective, and I shouldn't even say it's my own. I actually got that from a, a man by the name of uh, uh, Dr. Joe Temple years and years ago uh, when I was just a teenager. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to other questions and talk about the whole question of uh, what is theology. And uh, we'll be moving between the end of the books. Uh, notice my statements here on the overhead. It says, uh, overview of chapter 1, the nature of theology. That's the first thing we want to talk about. Uh, first of all, the definitions in theology. Secondly, approaches to the study of theology. Third, categories of theology. Uh, fourth, the development of doctrine in the Bible and last presuppositions. These are the areas that we need to talk about. And my access my systematic theology coming off this is chapter 1. And it, co it, uh, it corresponds some with what we have in uh, Cook's book here. Uh, first of all, what is theology? You know, what do you mean by it? Well, the, first of all, it's just, you know, it means a study of God. Theos, theos, God, logos, study, study of God, theology. I've had people say, well, you know, I don't want theology, I want Jesus. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> You ever had people talk that way? You know, they sort of demean theology and doctrine. You know, who cares about all those dry things? And they all usually quote a scripture out of context. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with that. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. As though that had anything to do with anything. Uh, and that's one reason why they need theology, because they haven't spent much time studying scripture, apparently, to know what the text means. But they'll make a statement like that, and I oftentimes call that bumper sticker theology. Little, little, uh, little quips and shibboleths that don't really say anything. But theology, what is theology? Uh, see, theology is a study of God. Now, how can a person say, well, I don't care about theology, you know, I want Jesus. Well, which Jesus are you talking about? You know, the Jesus of the Moonies, or the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, or the Jesus of the Nestorians in the ancient days, or Jesus of the Arians, or the Gnostics? Which Jesus are you talking about? Well, just Jesus. Well, that's the same thing, the name. There, you realize that Caiaphas, the high priest, his son's name was Jesus. They talking about him? It was Jesus. And one, there's all sorts of Jesuses rolling around Mexico. Just to say the word without any content doesn't mean a lot. You have to move into theology anytime you want to talk about God. Anytime you want to talk about salvation. Anytime you want to talk about anything that references the Christian faith. You must study theology. Theology is the study of God and God's perspective on His world, which includes all the spiritual issues with which we're concerned. If you'll notice that Cook here in, uh, on page 2 uh, goes into the way he talks about a basic uh, datum of all biblical theology, theological studies of God. The primary source of information about God is revelation, embodied in Jesus Christ and inscripturated in the Bible. Three, the basic motif of theology is the glory of God. That is, why do you study theology? What is the basic underlying idea in theology? Now this becomes really important because a lot of people believe that the reason for in the Bible, the reason for God even, the reason for everything in the universe is me. You know, even God floats around their little electron, you know, he, he's a little electron moving around them. I remember a friend of mine, a, a pastor of church, he was preaching the doctrine of the Trinity for a few Sundays, and somebody came up to him and said, Pastor so-and-so says, uh, you know, this, all this preaching on this heavy doctrine and stuff, you know, it's, just, it's just not fulfilling my needs. It just doesn't meet my needs. Get, you need to find something that's more practical. And then this person responds. He says, well, listen. He says, God 
is worthy to be studied simply for himself. He doesn't need to have something else to make him worthy of study. A person that speaks that way is human-centered, more particularly themselves-centered. But they are man-centered, not God-centered. They really do believe the universe exists for them. And that's why, even in reference to salvation, the Bible is not ultimately about salvation. It's not. Now that will upset some of my friends who have a certain uh, view of, of covenants that we'll get into later. But some people believe that the Bible is about salvation. That's what this book is about. No, no, it's not. It does talk about salvation, and it's an extremely important thing. The Bible is about God. He is the center. Uh, the Germans use a term, and there's a very fine book written called uh, New Testament Theology, and, and it, may, it may have had uh, another term like themes of New Testament Theology, and themes and all I can't remember exactly this, but by a man by the name of Gerhard Hosch. He was an outstanding scholar. He died just a few years ago, about four or five years ago. He belonged uh, finally to the Evangelical Theological Society. I had a chance to talk to him at length one day. A very fine scholar. Uh, he's written many works. But Gerhard Hazel, uh, he did these two volumes, not very thick, but that's you know, really thin. This says a lot in each one of them about what is the basic focus of the theology of Scripture? What's it all about? And some people say, well, it's the covenants. Some people say it's salvation. Somebody, somebody else says it's the kingdom of God. So, you know, you have all these different theories that have been argued by scholars over the years about what is the Bible. Ultimately, the, the, if you get right down to what is called the Mitte, M-I-T-T-E, it's a German term, the focus, the center, the middle. What is the focus? If, you, what, if you're aiming your, you know, your dart for the dark mode, what would the middle be? And finally, Hazel said, what it is, it's not all of these things, although those are all important. Ultimately, the Bible is about God. And so, one reason why in our study Bible, and you've seen that, uh, at the very beginning of the study Bible, we, we took pain, we, we thought through doing this, and we decided that we would have each of the themes, you, would you open up that up, Greg, uh, to the very beginning where we talk about the, uh, it's the first blue, a chart, the first blue chart in the book. I believe that's it. Old Testament. No, it, 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 that, well, maybe, maybe it is that. But turn it up, turn that open and see what we got. Do you have themes of the Bible? Uh, I'm sorry. Let me see. Just, you know, I should have brought my notes over here. I know what we're talking about. I think it's. Yeah, but it is there. And this, if we do it in the New Testament too. If you look at that, it said, uh, for example, Genesis 1 through 11, God begins his earthly work, 12 through 20. 50. God the sovereign establishes a plan. Exodus. What's the theme of it? God the Savior redeems his people. Leviticus. God the Holy provides true worship. Numbers. God chastens his people in love. Deuteronomy. God the King loves his people. What we're saying by that is that every book of the Bible, the real ultimate theme of every book is God. It's not something else. And people come up with all sorts of things, but the Bible is a book about God. Everything you read is to tell you who God is, something what God thinks, how God wants us to live. It's all relating to God. So ultimately we say then the scripture is doxological. Doxological. What we is mean by that is is that a D or an S in doxological? Oh, you know what I'm doing. I got my Greek going. <laughs> I was thinking, I was actually about to write a degree. I recognize that. That's yeah, I, you know, I was about to do a kasai. I was about to write a degree. <clears throat> the doxa. It's from a Greek term, just to give it to you. I'm in trouble already. It says it's doxa. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, man. So, but see, what we're saying about that is that lots of English terms, both in medicine, science, and in theology, are from Greek. And so we're saying. Scripture is docs, the motif is the glory of God. Everything is ultimately for the glory of God. Not the glory of man. And so it's not ultimately my salvation that the reason this is all happening. 
Even my salvation is a part of the whole. My salvation is ultimately for the glory of God. The creation of the universe is for the glory of God. How I live my life is for the glory of God. What God does in, in time and space, and when we see the book of Revelation, the end of all things, the destruction of all the enemies of God, is for the glory of God. Everything ultimately points back to God, not, not something else. And, and once we get that in our minds, then a lot of areas of theology that some people have terrible difficulty with cease to be any problem at all. Because the reason why a lot of people have troubles in theology is because they are they are man or human centered theology. They think, but what about me? I mean, it's just like the whole issue of sovereignty and free will that we'll talk about later. And you say anything about the sovereignty of God, and the first thing you'll hear is the free will of man. Why is that? It's because they think ultimately the whole reason for everything is them. You know what I tell people? I said, I realize that people have a will that they exercise when they choose to do it apart from coercion. I'm much more concerned, though, about the free will of God than I am the free will of man. Because every time I hear a person talk about the free will of man, when they're finished, God doesn't have a free will. I've heard it again and again. Every time I hear it, ultimately I realize that God is a limited deity and He can only act as we allow it. They don't, have, they don't believe in the free will of God. I believe in the free will of God. And I believe in, the, in, the, in the, the fact that human beings are responsible for their choices. We'll get into that later. That's another course even. That's not this one. But that's what I'm talking about. We must focus on God if we're going to be biblical theologians. Now the fourth one he gives here is the basic limitation of theological study is that those who compose it and those who study it are, here we are folks, here is us, in contrast to the doxology, we are finite and sinful. Which is to say, it behooves someone who's going to study theology to have a little bit of humility inside. Now, you talk to me a while, and, and I am convinced about all sorts of things. I have positions that I hold them strongly, and I argue them. But always within me, I try to keep that little measurement of, but you know, we need to be willing to listen to another person. It could be that I missed it. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I didn't quite get that right. We are all open to make mistakes. Now, I don't just accept the person, you know, somebody says, well, see, you know, uh, you ought to believe what I have to say, because I would say, okay, now, if you're right and I'm wrong, I am open to be proved wrong. Just open the scripture and show me a reasonable alternative to what I've given you. And why you're right, then I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it. Now, I can truly say that because I have changed my theology over the years. From time to time, as I've been convinced, I have changed thought. None of us has perfection of understanding. God is perfect. His Word is perfect. I am imperfect. Not only am I imperfect, I'm also sinful. Which means sometimes I might want to prove my point because I want to prove my point. In other words, I could be acting, it's possible to do, uh, it, it's possible to do Christian spiritual things in a wrong attitude. So uh, we just need to, to have a sense of humility about us. Now that's one problem we often encounter in theology, especially theologies. I shouldn't say especially theology students because it's true about professors too, who, are, who get very arrogant. And arrogance is not really a good thing for a Christian. No one should have arrogance. Uh, we, we need to emulate the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, according to Philippians 2, 5. And arrogance is not one of them. <laughs> so we need to rid ourselves of haughtiness, arrogance and pride and, and, uh, and those things that, uh, that certainly do not reflect uh, what we should be in Christ. And lastly, the basic wonder of theological study is that it is redemptively practical in its design for both faith and life. And that's what amazes me so often when people talk about the fact that, well, I don't want to talk about theology, I want practical training. Basic nature of Theological study, did you say? Well, it's in the notes. Oh, I'm reading. <laughs> the, the basic wonder 
of theological study is that it is redemptively practical. So when a person says, I don't want to talk about theology and doctrine, I want something practical. I'm saying, what do you mean? There is nothing more practical than theology. Now, it's not practical as they want. Because see, they want the latest thing, and it's a human-centered theology. They want Christianity to function like a local health spa. Or, you know, they want to go into a Christian bookstore and find help me books, self-help books, that help them solve their little problems uh, in their own flesh, usually. Just like you go in and you've got books on how to do diets, you know, this diet, that diet, this exercise scheme, that. That's what they want. And God's not much into that. For spiritual growth doesn't take place that way. Spiritual growth takes place the more I see God in this book, then I begin to reflect that God in my life. The more I find out how Jesus acts and the more I read about Jesus, that should cause me to continue to grow and be a different kind of person. It should relate very practically to my life. Uh, but, but some people want something quite different from that. They want these little self-help books. And so you get books like The Prayer of Jabez. You know, Lord, help me to learn how to get more money. And of course, that's what uh, Jesus taught them Lord in the disciples' prayer, you know. And Lord, bring more money. You read that in there, I assume. Uh, we, we missed it. Matter of fact, the disciples' prayer, sometimes called the Lord's Prayer, I always say the Lord's Prayer is John 17. Yeah. The disciples' prayer is, Our Father who art in heaven, let your name be held sacred. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Now see, we don't pray. Lord, uh, you are in heaven, I know that. And uh, Lord, let my will be done and let my kingdom come. And uh, may my name be held sacred by people. And we, we are self-centered. That's why most of our prayers start out with, Lord, I need. Listen to prayers. I just, it, prayer meetings are very informative. Just sit there and listen to the prayers of prayer meeting. They'll give you a good perspective of why, uh, how prayer is done. <laughs> it's give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And now we sometimes are altruistic. You know, give him, give him, yeah, give him, give him. <laughs> I mean, we can, but it's always, Lord, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Well, it's okay to pray for your back, though. Yeah. But when we're talking about prayer, you look at when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, here it is. Our Father, who art in heaven. Was, Get your perspective on God first. How would be your name? That is, think about the character of God and its sacredness. We have, we're asking here for contemplation here. Now, I'm not for Easter mystic, you know, contemplation, you know, you know, where you have even some of this new contemplative prayer that even Christians are getting into, which is simply a, a form of Buddhism brought in, into, into Christianity. If you hear about contemplative prayer in Christianity today, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's just a, a Christianized form of Buddhism. But, but on the other hand, it, we are to reflect and contemplate on God. It's, you know, how will be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here we get to us. After you've gone through all that, and here's all it is, though. Give us today what we need for today. Our daily bread. And forgive us as we've forgiven those. Uh, for, forgive us as we've forgiven those who have offended us. Lead us not into temptation. Not talking about Lord in a new car, a new house, or anything. Spiritual things. And keep us from the evil one. But you look at the you look at the disciples' prayer, and it doesn't really quite much with our praying. And the reason why is because we are human-centered in our theology. We are basically a human-centered theological center. The United States of America and our churches are man-centered. They're not God-centered. By and large. What I'm hoping comes out of this seminary, now there's many reasons why we want to start this seminary. And one of the reasons why is because I want the people who come out of the seminary to be God-centered in their theology, God-centered in ministry, following the scripture as they develop what is right and wrong and true and false and how they should practice their churches and ministries, and say the latest fad or the latest book published by somebody. 
Because he has 10,000 people in his church, you know, 10,000 people can't be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if a church has 100,000, it's fine with me. I thank God for it. But it's got to be based on biblical principles the whole way. And there are churches that do actually grow and do well because they do follow biblical principles. There are other churches, though, that grow and that don't follow biblical principles, which means that numbers is not a sign of God's blessings. That's right. And numbers are not a sign either. Small numbers are big numbers. I mean, there are churches that have small numbers that also are not following God in the Scripture. So numbers is irrelevant. The issue is we need to go back and say, listen, what does the Scripture say? And if you do that, as far as I'm concerned, you've been a successful minister of God. Long ago, even in evangelism, I learned something that became very important to me. And that was that God does not ask us to bring out results. God is not looking for success. He's looking for faithfulness. He brings the success. <laughs> there's some people think that they have to be the ones that are successful. When God's successful, all we have to do is be faithful. And again, I'm just emphasizing the importance of God-centered theology and God-centered ministry. And that's so important to me that we do things that way. Well, let's talk here. We're just getting going now. Definitions in theology. We'll turn to page 3. And uh, look what Cook has to say here. From the Reformation until the 19th century. We're at the bottom of page 3. From the Reformation until the 19th century, theology was conceived of as a basically objective study. Key concept. See, objective truth. Now, objective truth means that we can put it on the board and we can all look at it together and see the same thing. Okay? When we read the words, we all can understand the same thing. And if it's a teaching, we all can not only understand and, 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 and see the same thing, but we can all be held to the same standard. Objective means it's outside of me. I don't control it. It controls me. It's a standard to which I adhere subjectively. My subjectivity should relate to the objectivity. It's the card and the horse problem. You don't put the horse front and you put the cart second. You know, can you see a guy that takes his horses, puts it at the back of the cart, and say, okay, push, push, push. <laughs> it's not a smart way to do it. And yet a lot of people deal with these issues that way. It's like a horse at the back, you're teaching to push the cart. It works so much better just to put the horse at the front and roll the wheels. <laughs> and, and, and develop good theology is the same way. I have a sermon I preach on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 that says, good theology produces good doxology. If you have good theology, it will then bring out the proper glory of God. If you have bad theology, you don't. Good theology produces good doxology. Hopefully, whatever we do in word and deed, we do it all to the Glory. Glory of God. You read that passage? Maybe I've seen that before, I think. I think that may be the Wayne House edition. But, but nonetheless, good theology produces good doxology and hopefully what our life is about. You know, Paul in the end of Romans 11 has that beautiful, beautiful statement that says, uh, who is given to God that God should repay? You know? and, and then it goes on to say that for, for of Him and through Him and to Him for all things. They have their origin in God, they operate through God's work, and they have their end in God. God is all, in all. And so uh, that should be our desire. And so theology was objective. That is, you could ever, all of us could look at it and see, yes, we can understand truth. This means something. You know, we could look at the Trinity, we could look at the deity of Christ, we could look at salvation. We could all come to agreement because words have meaning. Meaning is understandable. We can actually come to an agreement of word. Now, it's interesting that people today, some people will say, well, no, that's not possible. Everybody has their own truth, blah, blah. And yet, you can get them on any number of subjects and they, they'll want you to agree with them. You know, I had a guy, I went to a New Age carnival one time. I call it New Age carnival. It was a whole life expo down there. at uh, 20,000 New Agers, except for a few of us evangelicals, roaming around. We went there to witness. They didn't know what they were in for. But... 
Uh, we're moving around, and I thought, man, this looks like probably Paul encountered in Athens. You know, uh, you know they had numerologists over here. You had phrenologists over here checking bumps on the head. You had tarot readers over here. You had astrologers over here. You had people selling grass to eat because it's good for you. You squeeze it out and drink it. And, and you had you had people with everything. You had people with stand, you know, doing trying to do uh, massages, and they want to put you on their on their feet and lie on. While you're up in the air, they're doing stuff. To, everything imaginable. Keep people talking about fire walking and, and you name it, it was there. There were probably 200 booths. This was in Eugene, right? No, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, not was good. But San Francisco. And encountered a guy who was selling uh, natural vegetables. And he had these big signs up no pesticides, all natural vegetables. Potatoes and corn and all sorts of stuff. Probably did. And started talking to him, and he uh, was talking about. He said, "Well, you know, I, uh, you know, it's okay for you to believe those things, but that's your truth. That's not my truth. I have a different truth. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no, I mean, basically, there's no objective standard by which we can both understand each other and come to an agreement. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth. And he said, and then he told me, he said, you know, I think you shouldn't be pushing your ideas on other people." And I said, you know, I think I understand you. And I said, what you're saying is that what is true for you is may not be true for me. What is true for me might not be true for you. And, and we should try to push these ideas on each other. That's right. I said, let me tell you what I think is true. I think the more pesticides on vegetables, the better. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think if you don't have a lot of pesticide on a potato, it's probably worth this to eat. Pesticides are good for you. And he's just, he's fuming here with me. And I said, you know what really bothers me is that you have this sign up seeking to impose your viewpoint on me. Mm -hmm. And he got the point. See, whether they are or aren't are a debatable question. And we may not even agree as to the answer. But we can admit that there is an answer. If we have all the facts mm -hmm. present, we should come to the same position if there's objective truth in the outcome. See, sometimes we don't know what the truth is. We can debate it. I mean, there are some people that are pre-trib, some that are post-trib. But I would hope that we're not sort of agnostically so. There is a truth. Either it is going to happen, either Christ coming for the church is going to happen before tribulation period, or it's going to happen after tribulation period, or it's going to occur in the middle of tribulation. It's going to occur sometime. You can have all sorts of different views. Several people are wrong. Only one, or at least possible one is right. But there is some truth. And if we could follow the scripture carefully enough, we should come eventually to the same conclusion if we follow some certain hermeneutically consistent. So it's okay. I can deal with the fact that we don't agree. But for a person to say that truth can't even be known, it's a problem. Well, see, initially, theology dealt with objective truth. And that's what we have here, objective study. It was viewed as the science of God. Divine things in his relation to the universe. Evangelical theologians continue to hold this view to this day. But from his Friedrich Schleiermacher on, a radically different view has been held by many. With his thinking, which viewed theology as a science of the Christian faith, liberal theology was born. Since religion was for him a matter of feeling rather than dogma, it became completely subjective. <clears throat> now, you know, you believe in God? Great. Belief is something, and, and this is how it's been developed in the culture. Every time you hear people on news, your faith position, that means something you hold down deep inside which has no objective reality to it. It's how you feel about it. it, it you're not saying it is the truth that you hold to for logical and reasonable reasons, but it's something you just feel that you ought to do. So the world has adopted, by the way, it's, the, it's, it's Christians that begin to do, develop this view, not secularists. We begin to say that, well, you know, it's down deep in my heart. It's, you know, it's this thing inside. You hear people do that today, even in churches, you know. You'll talk about the Bible. Say, I know what that says, but but I just know what I feel. You know, I God told me. You know, I've never heard God tell me anything other than Scripture. 
But God told me, or I just feel that this is true, as though feelings determine truth. Truth is objective. That's why you have a book that has words in it. Everybody can read the same book together and it only conveys one meaning. Now, there may be different ways people look at it, but if you, if everybody thought consistently with the same of principles, everybody would think the same about every passage. Well, that's the potential. But again, whether I understand it correctly or not is beside the point. It is objective because God created it objective. And how I feel is quite irrelevant to truth. Matter of fact, that's the way it is. You know, it used to be, for example, that Karl Barth, we'll get into Barth later, but Karl Barth said, well, you know, God worked through individuals to produce a book. It's a fallible book, but he helped produce a book. And when you read it someday, and all of a sudden, maybe you read this passage that I'm looking at now in Acts 10:44. Uh, you didn't just turn it, but I just turned to the passage. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Maybe I've read that a dozen times, and I said, okay. And all of a sudden today, I'm looking at them. Look at this, Peter spoke, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, that, that's, that's great. That, that's, that's a trip. And, he, and all of a sudden, you get an insight. You think, man, that, that probably relates to me. Then at that point, Bart said, that became the Word of God. It wasn't before it did that. Before I had that encounter, and before I had that, 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 great, that great insight, it was just human words. But when I all of a sudden had an encounter, Bart said, that became the Word of God. But see, my view is, that's the Word of God, whether I like it, don't like it, encounter it, don't encounter it, never read it my whole life or not, it's irrelevant. It's the Word of God because it's objectively the Word of God. If I die or don't die, whether I or whether I ever live, it's the Word of God regardless. So the church has nothing to say about interpretation. In that sense. Well, ultimately, because it's just what God encounters me with. My own personal truth is all that matters. And so you can't hold me responsible. If I say I believe God is seven, I believe God is six people, I just feel it down deep inside. Or I had a dream last night, or something. If my experience determines truth, where I would say, no, no, no. The Bible presents God as three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three distinctions that are eternally existent. That's the Bible. You say God is six, it's irrelevant what you think. God doesn't change because of your feelings. See, but we've got to move beyond, but see, because even today in the churches, some churches, and I'm not talking about just charismatic churches, I'm talking about all sorts of churches. People that their feelings determine their theology. We must not let people get away with it. The church is lost if we move that way. Now, I believe the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I believe that, that Christ will present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I think all those things will take place. And so having said that, I, I don't think it's going to fail. The church is going to continue. But it won't continue unless people are faithful to the Scripture. Because ultimately the church is not based on an experience church is built upon a truth. Jesus Christ, a true historical person who lived in time and space, died on the cross, rose from the dead in a physical body in time and space history, ascended in time and space history, and built upon the teachings of the apostles. Facts, objective reality, and truth. If that didn't exist, there is no church worthy of being there. Again, God-centered, not man-centered theology. Now you can read. Uh, definitions of theology then we're talking about a theological objectivity not a theological subjectivity notice he said such a view is fraught with dangers and divorces theology from the objective foundation of the word of God it reduces theology to a mere descriptive science dealing with historical and psychological phenomena rather than aiming at absolute truth absolute truth see and it leads to the conclusion that Christianity is merely one of many religions in the world. Different in degree, but not in essence. And that's why you'll have some people today, even people that supposedly believe in Christianity, will say, well, Jesus Christ is not the only way to God. He's just the best way to God. 
All religions have truth that lead people to God, but Christianity is the most pure of them all. It provides the best understanding of God's work. The others also provide understanding, and people can come to God that way too. And I say, that is not biblical teaching. Christ said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Christ, uh, Paul says that there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. I mean, that's Paul's teaching. That's Jesus' teaching. But other people have views because they base it on feelings. That is, it just can't, it's just not right. People, you know, everybody's got to be saved somehow. And so they look at the world and say, there's six billion people. They realize you've got a billion Muslims. You've got, a, you've got almost a billion Hindus. And you say, oh my goodness, if what you're saying is true, they actually are not going to be saved. Well, not unless they hear the gospel and believe in Jesus. But that's not right. That's not fair. I don't like it. Narrow-minded. Yeah. But you know what I think? It, it bothers them. See, it just, it just doesn't seem right to me. Again, it's because they're building their theology on themselves and not God. And so you don't use your own standards and your own, uh, your own measurements of right and wrong to determine truth. I'm supposed to conform myself to Scripture, not Scripture to me. And if, and if I've had people say when I've taught some passages of Scripture, Romans particularly, they say, well, I don't like this. That's not the God I worship. But I say, probably is not. <laughs> <laughs> you, probably worship, you probably worship a God that you've created. But this is the only God that exists, the one the Bible presents. If you don't like the one that the Bible presents, you do have to create your own. And even if your God is similar to the God of the Bible, I guarantee you I can find many points of similarity between gods in Canaan and Yahweh. There were points of commonality between the gods of the ancient world and the true God. Points of commonality. But it's not enough to be right in 75% of the time and be the true God. You've got to be, the true God has to be 100%, not 75%. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, you say, well, that's not my, that's not the God I worship, probably not. Because what our job is, is to read Scripture and conform to the God of the Bible. And if there's something more that I need to do to understand the God of the Bible, then you need to challenge me to be that way and think that way. I grant to you that all of us at times probably are idolaters. Because we think wrong and ignoble thoughts about God. We believe he's, as the prophet says in Isaiah, that he is a man like ourselves. Uh, we, we put him in human terms and make him fit our image. To some degree, we're, we all have an incorrect view of who God is, even today. Probably to some degree. Yeah. But hopefully, the, what we're doing in Scripture and in theology is purifying our minds, transforming our minds. And we, we are called to, to conform our thoughts to God. Now, uh, and then he talks about what systematic theology is. Now, uh, we'll, we'll move from that to uh, approaches to the study of theology. But I'm going to take a, a, a short break, I think. How, where are we with that? Is, how many minutes? 23 minutes. We have 23 minutes left. Well, maybe I'll go on and then we'll take a break at that time. The rest of the will be the take. Since we don't have anybody here lying, I don't want you to have to monitor all the time. Approaches to the study of theology. We just need to make sure I quit here in uh, about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, approaches to the study of theology. Well, there are different ways of theology. And here we are. We're still in chapter 1 of Cook. We're actually in the last portion here. Systematic Theology and the Theological Encyclopedias. But I'll be telling you some other things here. So we're going to be talking about definitions of theology, approaches to the study of theology, categories, development, and presuppositions. So let's move on and look at some of the approaches to the study of theology. Theology can be broken down into many different areas. One is biblical theology, systematic theology, dogmatic, historical, and practical. These are the major ways in which we think about theology. We are not studying in here biblical theology or dogmatic or historical or practical. Which is not to say that we will not intrude, or maybe that's not the right word, will not enter into 
uh, those fields from time to time as it's appropriate. None of these areas are just in, absolutely independent of each other. Biblical theology is theology as we see it developed in the text of Scripture. Like, for example, does if you read John's letters and his gospel and the Revelation, and you read Paul and all his letters, you will see many points of commonality between Paul and John. But you will notice, however, that there are concepts and themes and ideas that Paul develops that John never does. And there are things that John develops that Paul never does. And even when they talk about the same issues, they don't always say it in exactly the same way. They have their own peculiarities because these are books written by human beings as they seek to interact with the Christ event and biblical history. So, when you read John, for example, his, uh, gospel, his gospel in chapter 1, his whole development of the Lagos Christology, is, is certainly Paul believed that Jesus was God too, and Paul believed Jesus was a man. But he never develops it the way John does in John chapter 1. Never, in any of his letters. Even though I, I have no doubt with that they share a common faith, common doctrine, but they did not state it in the same way. And so the way in which given authors of scriptures uh, develop theology is called biblical theology. That's why you can talk about Johannine, which is simply John, Johannine theology, Pauline theology, Petrine, guess who that is? Peter, Peter theology. Uh, and then you have obviously uh, theology, Matthean and Markin and Lucan theology. And then Old Testament studies too, you know, has theology, you know, how it's developed by various authors of the Old Testament. They develop theology differently. Now I am not saying, please do not hear me to say, I am not saying that there's contradiction between these people. I'm saying there's supplementation. They write differently and reinforce each other and say it in different ways. They supplement each other. He can't, the word perspective wouldn't be accurate either, because right? I've used it. Yeah, sense. their own perspective. I, perspective is not a bad word, but what we do not mean by that is that other perspectives then may not be accurate. Uh, well, some, the, the sense of four people watching an act, traffic accident, yeah. four perspectives. For, it can be okay, but sometimes perspective, people mean by that, that uh, that correctively so. <clears throat> you have four people watching an accident and they're right in some ways and wrong in some ways. You know, uh, I know that having been a uh, deputy sheriff for a while and having been out on accidents and you'll get accounts but not all the accounts, oftentimes accounts are supplemental but sometimes they're a little contradictory. You know, certain things can't happen certain ways. Even if he thought it happened that way, it didn't happen that way. He thought it did, but it just simply didn't. Physical laws have been violated, you know. So uh, perspectives oftentimes, yes, will supplement each other and sort of bring out a whole, but there are also flaws sometimes in perspectives. So it, according to what we mean. Uh, so I they're, think they're exclusive, then obviously uh, it's got to be. I mean, if the guy on corner or north corner said a certain way, then and all the rest of them are wrong, then he's made an exclusive yes. perspective statement. <clears throat> and, and they're never that way. They can never be right. Yeah. But see, I think we have the four Gospels that are not contradictory to each other. I think they truly present four or views of the same reality. And they are certainly in different, uh, uh, different emphases. Well, biblical theology is one thing. Uh, then we have systematic theology, and that's what this course is all about. Systematic theology seems to be where everybody wants to head. It's sort of the queen, as it were. Uh, systematic theology, you'll hear, matter of fact, I'm always amused by because see, my doctor was in New Testament, and I had a minor in, uh, in, uh, in historical theology and, and uh, uh, in Old Testament also, in Old Testament, New Testament, historical theology. And 
eventually I, be, I moved to theology instead of New Testament studies. And a lot of people have. And you can go back and look and you find out a lot of contemporary systematic theologians once upon a time are New Testament scholars. Uh, you've seen Wayne Gruden's theology. Uh, Wayne was a professor of New Testament. He did his dissertation under Mull at Cambridge in that area. Uh, John Murray, who became professor of systematic theology at Westminster, was a New Testament prophet. And uh, S. Lewis Johnson was a New Testament professor at Dallas before he became systematic theology. And on and on. A lot of people moved from New Testament. There's sort of, I guess, in all of us a desire to sort of put all this together. So you'll hear New Testament scholars, Old Testament scholars talking about issues, moving outside the area of their field because they want to somehow piece all the passages together <laughs> and try to get a unified whole thought. That's natural for us to do. <clears throat> well, systematic theology is, is organized theology. Now, there are a lot of people who have unsystematic theology. So that means it's disorganized. It's a disorganized theology. And because of that, they sometimes do uh, some pretty strange things. Uh, I know I heard one uh, famous uh, preacher like, out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, that in the same sermon, he must have contradicted himself three or four different times. He never had his thoughts together. He didn't realize that he, he, he kept undoing what he was saying. He kept contradicting himself. He had never thought through this thing to get it organized in his mind and have consistency and, and, and intelligibility, intelligibility to it. So uh, it's important to be a systematic thinker. You know, be able to connect the dots. But a lot of people have disorganized theology. As a matter of fact, most people that you'll talk to when they start talking Bible, you know, they'll start roaming here, roaming there, and, and, and running all over the place, not realizing that sometimes when they say this statement, that statement can't be true because they just said this statement, this is absolutely contrary to it. All of us have to follow the three laws of logic. The law of identity, the law of, of the excluded middle, the law of non-contradiction. It's necessary to function to think in those terms. You know, and, and the, the major one you find people connected to is the law of non-contradiction. Two things cannot both be true, two things that are opposite, cannot both be true in the same way at the same time. It's not possible. What was the second law? Excluded middle. Either, it it's either has to be A or B. <laughs> yeah. the, the, little, the rule of identity says uh, A is A. And the excluded middle says that either A or B. Right. And the law of non-contradiction uh, essentially says that you cannot have A and B both be true in the same way at the same time. And yet you'll have people make arguments that, that they come out that way. Now, logic is important, and uh, we'll probably offer an course of logic now. But um, that used to be required once upon a time when people used to go to school. You had to actually take logic. It would help us a lot today when you hear all these things going on in the news sometimes and hear stuff. Um, but systematic theology is what you're going to be studying. Now, dogmatic theology is similar to systematic theology, but dogmatic theology generally is a particular denominational perspective, like Lutheran theology or Reformed theology or Roman Catholic theology or some other theology, which is more geared to an ecclesiastical perspective and oftentimes connected to, the, to either creeds or confessions of a particular group. Now that's not to say in systematic theology you take no cognizance of, you know, creeds or confessions. I mean, they can be good, but they don't, they don't ultimately guide you to truth. If sometimes a person, if you listen to a dogmatic theologian, or if you listen to some people within certain denominational uh, groups, uh, you'll start talking about truth. The first thing, they'll not be quoting scripture. The first thing they'll quote is a confession to you. You know, Westminster Confession. Well, the Westminster Confession, the so-called divines of Westminster, is okay. I mean, these guys were good people. But whether they, whether they thought something was right or wrong is really quite irrelevant to me. Uh, I will use them as a persuasive authority to help me understand things. But they are not the determiner of truth or not. Scripture is. 
And so, for example, even the creeds, you know, it's the uh, famous, uh, uh, the famous Apostles' Creed, as it was written uh, later, said about Christ's descent into Sheol, to hell. The earlier Roman Creed did not have that statement about the descent into hell. That was added later and used in the uh, Nicene Creed. Well, I appreciate the Nicene Creed, and I like the Apostles' Creed, even the later one, but I don't agree with the statement, because I can't find any biblical evidence that Jesus went to hell. And I know how some people come to it, 1 Peter 3, but it's not talking about that. And, and I know how some people do with that passage, for example, that he, is, he descended into the, uh, the lower parts of the earth, but it doesn't mean underneath the earth. He's talking about on the, on the land where you walk on over against where the angels fly. Because they had the world divided up between basically the air and the earth. And so the lower part of the earth would be where you walk. And, and there's good evidence for this. But the point of it is, uh, even if a creed says something, it doesn't mean it's correct. A dogmatic theology. Historical theology is a little different than just church history. Church history can be simply telling you about the historical events. Historical theology seeks to help you to understand the development of the theology. You know, when you read the second century fathers and you read the fourth century fathers, in two centuries they came a long way in thinking. And you have to explain why did they not argue this point in the second century and yet they did in the fourth century? Or what about the teaching of the three A's in the medieval period, Augustine and Sam and Aquinas? The, you know, the three A's. The, the, uh, where, where did the theology come from? Why did they argue the way they did? Ex arguments for the existence of God, for example. You see it begin to be developed in the medieval period with Anselm and, and Aquinas particularly. And some of these things. In other words, you try to see where theology came from in its development. And lastly, practical theology, and again, I don't like the terminology, but it's sort of with us. Practical theology usually means something like, you know, you are trying to understand uh, how theology applies to life. And I think all theology is practical, but uh, we'll move on from there. Now, the next area, Dr. Krauss, yes. could you make a distinction, please, between biblical theology and systematic theology? Biblical theology is when you're examining the theology of given, a given book of Scripture or books of Scripture of a particular author or such like. Or even New Testament theology versus Old Testament theology in more general terms. Systematic is that you use all the scripture throughout, bringing it together to bear on a point of theology. In other words, all the scripture teaches about God. All the scripture teaches about Christ. All the scripture teaches about justification and the law. Every area of theology you want to think about, all that the scripture teaches on this subject. Try to bring all the proof to bear. Organize it in a meaningful form to understand it. Now, it's wise when you do systematic theology that you're cognizant of biblical theology. You should, because sometimes if you're not careful to read in context, you can just be proof texting stuff out. And people do that, you know, where you'll just take a passage here, a passage here, a passage here, without any consideration for the context of any of those passages. And use it to prove, prove something. I mean, people do it all the time. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, what, are, what does it mean? I don't you know. We can discuss what it means. But people quote that without ever looking in the context. So all I'm saying, if you quote it, look in the context. Or, for example, the ways of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ the Lord. Look at the context. Or, behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man opens to me, I will come in so blah. Look at the context. Because you can take those passages and use them to develop a theology that may not even reflect what the passage is talking about. So it is important to be contextual and be, be knowledgeable about biblical theology as you do systematic. That's why I strongly encourage developing theology from major texts. If I want to talk about the doctrine of humility, it would be wise for me to develop that doctrine from John 13, from the book of Philippians, particularly Philippians 2, and passages there are major portions of Scripture that talk about the concept. Not a verse. Not a given verse. Now, you can use a given verse, right. but a given verse should be taken into consideration with passages that develop it. I mean, if I want to talk about the deity of Christ, I need to look at John chapter 1. 
you know, I need to look at, uh, at passages that, that have lengthy developments of that doctrine. Which is not to so say you cannot look at an individual passage, but just it's, it's good to look at, at uh, theology uh, in light of major passages of Scripture where the author, that's his point in writing it, is to develop that doctrine. And then fit all the others into it. Well, when we come back here after a break, we're going to take a look at categories of theology and explain what each of these are. Push the pause button. I'm pushing it. No, you're not. Your fingers are going place. <laughs> oh, here. Did you push this? Yeah. That's what I want. Okay, I thought you were pushing it. All right, now.